Appreciate you guys. Let me make sure this is on so I don't get in trouble. Is it on? Okay, you just have it turned down really low. All right. Well, it's great to be back. I love being in State College. You have no idea. Uh, the last four years I got back for one football game, so it's, uh, my, I still meet my, all my old roommates and we still get together and do what we used to do uh, 30 years ago. So uh, anyway, uh, what we're going to do today is, 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 as Professor Hawkins talked about, I mean, I, I get to work with rural hospitals all over the country. That's what I'm from a small rural town in upstate New York. Um, I came to Penn State, and um, it's it's uh, it's what I really love to do. It almost kind of give back to 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 my rural uh, roots. So, um, um, what we're going to do today is is we're going to talk about where this where the healthcare system's going, why it's going there, and I think if we understand the under the reason underlying reasons why it it affirms our case for the changes that we have to make going forward. And then talk about, okay, and then, and then there's this little piece in the presentation around that rural hospitals have a unique value in this new world. And so if the market's going in this direction, and, why, and here's why it's going, if rural hospitals have this unique value proposition, then, then what do we have to do to get there? We talk about the concept of population health. Every time I sit in a conference and hear people talk about population health, I leave the conference going like, what the hell's pop population health? <laughs> And, and I think for the next 10 years, it's more of a verb than it is a noun. It's a, it's, it's, it's a manifestation of transforming our sick care system, creating a health care system, and transforming payment, and, and, and keeping all of these in lock sync as we transform incrementally the payment system. Now, I just said a whole lot there in that last 30 seconds. You don't know what I'm talking about. Hopefully at the end, if I say that same thing again, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to grab one of these things that makes the thing go. So, so let's, let's start off with saying, hey, um, you know, where, where is the market going and why? And, and I always like to kind of start with some high level, what's going on in the industry as I see it and why it's important to where we're going. Um, and you can just look at some of these things. You, you look at the high deductible health plans, and I've got a graphic on that. And, 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 and that's a change. That is something that's different. It's just in the last 10 years, and it has a huge impact. Uh, under insurance and, and, and the fact that we have, you know, the people that are on the exchanges and, 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 and have, you know, really the you know, silver plans and the, these are underinsured populations. Um, the shift outpatient care, reduced readmissions, um, um, kind of macro. Have you guys talked about macro? Do you know what I'm talking about there? Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, the Affordable Care Act. You know, the Affordable Care Act, uh, it's still the law of the land, and a, a major provisions of it are still intact, although some of them have come out. And then this one is the one that's really have gotten very interesting. And I'm sure in your class, you, not only are you going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but it's really going to drive the next phase of delivery. It's going to force us to transform faster than I think we're ready to transform. And, and, and stay tuned for that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So first, let's just touch on some of these. Um, um, you know, first is the growth of the high deductible health plans. And, and in 2006, 16% of small businesses had a high deductible health plan. In 2016, 65% of small businesses had a high deductible health plan. What's different about that? What does a high deductible health plan do to you as, as consumers of sick care services? You got to pay a lot more. So all of a sudden, it used to be uh, 10 years ago, we always talked about the fact that there was no, you know, there was no tie in to the consumer back pocket, you know, the wallet, that, that they could just consume, 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 and never have to spend money because it was traditional insurance. That has changed. Like one of my colleagues uh, in, in December, he was, um, he was a, he's a CrossFit guy. He came off a bar, landed on his ankle, pretty much knew he blew his ankle out. And his wife came to pick him up, and she's, come on, we're going to the emergency room. And he said, no, we're going to go to the urgent care center. Because the urgent care center, he's getting a bill for 400 bucks. If he's going to the emergency room, he's getting a bill for 2,500 bucks. All of a sudden, we have, a, oh, I, just, I, I forgot to tell you, we have a, uh, in my company, we have a $5,000 deductible, of which my company, wait, 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 it gets better. I'm, I'm, I'm the most principal guy there, so I get to make decisions. <laughs> Of which we have a HSA, a health savings account, in which the company funds all $5,000 into the health savings account. 
It doesn't matter though, because at the end of the year, if I don't spend, or my kids don't spend, which is the real issue, if I don't spend health care, or sick, you know, if I don't spend for sick care, that money's left. It's in, in a checking account. I can go online and look and see what's in my checking account. I am now, with these high deductible health plans, I'm attached to consumption through the hip pocket. Something very different than in the past. Reduced emissions. You know, when the uh, value-based purchasing program came online, all of a sudden, um, in, in, in penalties for, for um, you know, this was part of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, that now we have hospitals that have an inordinately high percent of, of, of high uh, readmissions get penalized. And so, guess what happened? The rate of the readmissions came down. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? I mean, the penalties on these aren't very mat uh, material at all. But let's, let's, let's go to Altoona Hospital. At one point had a, a <laughs> hmm, we're familiar with that one. Yeah. Uh, we had a re readmission rate of 21%. That, those 21% of patients that got readmitted were revenue. Right? They were revenue to the hospital. Now they come down to here, and they're in the 19%. This is less revenue. This is less inpatient revenue, which the big boys in the big cities live off of inpatient revenue. 50 to 60% of large hospitals, large you know, non-rural hospitals, live off of the inpatient revenue stream. And look what this has done to the discharge rate per thousand between 2005 and 2016. Now, you're a big hospital in Altoona. 50% of your business is inpatient care. Your admission rate in Pennsylvania was 151 admissions per thousand population. Between 2008, eight years later, it's at 123. Put this trajectory into a 10-year forecast. When you're living 50% of your revenue on inpatient care, is that a business that you can stand to be in? Well, at least we got to start thinking about a diversification strategy, right? <laughs> because that is a trend. And, and frankly, you're nowhere near. Right now, uh, you know, here's the U.S. rate. You're 103. If you go to places like Vermont, where they eat a lot of granola and all of that, and they don't eat all that, uh, you know, Philly cheesesteaks and all that stuff, uh, buffalo chicken wings for the you know, northern part uh, of Pennsylvania, you know, they're down in like the low 90s to even high 80s. So you have plenty of meat on that chicken wing bone to bring this, continue to bring this down, right? So, so macro, you guys, you, you nodded that you, that you spent some time talking about macro. What, what did you come away with your conversation around macro? Yeah? Well, I um, had my internship with macro. We worked with the ECO, so we got to work a lot with all the metrics. Okay. Yeah. I think I got the most out of like how the physicians were able to communicate with us. Yeah. And like what they liked it. Metrics, but it's a lot of What's the driving force behind macro, though, that, that is going to transform the industry? The for differently, right? Yeah. Right. So you got so who's who who needs a little bit of just 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 update on macro? You, 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 okay, okay, okay. All right. We got we got some guys just coming in. All right. Uh, so so back in uh, was it 2015? Democrats and Republicans came together to pass a bill that actually, we, at the time, it was called the SGR fix, the Sustainable Growth Rate Fix. Because what was going on in the past is that the physicians, um, the way the physician pay schedule, going back to in, into the 90s, was supposed to work, back to like 1997, is the physicians were supposed to get an update inflation, 3%. But then any gains in productivity for the year, it was going to come off of that. And so the physicians, their next year, this is the sustainable growth rate, the physicians would, instead of getting, say, a 3% increase, overall across the industry, we saw, say, a 3% increase in productivity. You have to back that off the 3% inflation rate. So the physicians are supposed to get 0% increase for next year. And, and what happened is Congress blinked the first year this happened and said, we can't afford to not pay physicians an increase, so we're going to give them 3%. But we're going to tack that that 3% that, that we just gave away on to next year. And we're going to go get them next year. Well, this kept going on and on and on for 15 years until the point where the physicians were looking at a 22% cut in pay just because, just to make this sustainable growth rate work. So, so Congress said, we got to fix this thing. 
And the way they fixed it, uh, Republicans and Democrats came together and said, we're going to fundamentally transform physician payment. We are going to set up two tracks. We're going to set up a track, and it's the MIPS. That if, well, let's just say, if you have a certain percent of your payer mix in an advanced alternative payment model, like a, a you know advanced ACO, a risk-taking ACO, um, um, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of other things. If you had a certain percent of your payer mix in one of these payments, you'll get a 5% increase in payment starting in 2019. And that you'll just get that 5% one time. And then any bonuses that come to you as a part of being in one of these advanced alternative payment models. Now, most of the physicians are not going to meet that, had not met that criteria. So everyone else is going to fall into this category called the Merit Incentive Payment System, MIPS. And what this said is that we're going to measure your physician performance around, around four criteria. And the criteria are clinical practice improvement, use of electronic health records, quality of care, and then this last one, resource utilization. How do you spend your Medicare beneficiaries' dollars? And what we're going to do is we're going to come up, we're going to measure you against all your peers, come up with a composite score. And depending on how you score relative to all your peers, you could get an upward adjustment at, to a, an, or a downward adjustment. Beginning in 2019, for a, pre, or for, for a measurement period in 17, the p plus or minus could be 4%. Uh, the year that we're in right now, we're in 2018 for measurement year 2020, it's a 5% differential. But it goes all the way out to the point when, when we're in 2022, there's a plus or minus differential of, of you know, essentially 18%. And so ultimately what it was doing, two things. It was forcing physicians to, you know, the grassroots of, of true health care into a payment system that looked at, um, you, know, you know, away from straight fee for service to one looking at quality, but ultimately transforming them into advanced alternative payment models. Right, so that's what this thing is. So I look at the effects of macro, there's twofold. One is, we used to know that this population health thing was coming at some point, but we didn't really know the timing of it. I would say the tipping point for the timing of it is about here, when the differential in fee-for-service payment is, is, is 18%, where physicians are saying, we cannot take the risk. We've got to move to an advanced alternative payment model. The second thing I will point out is that, the, 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 that I think is meaningful is that Republicans and Democrats came together on this thing. Anybody thinks that we are not moving to, to fundamentally transform payment, because they think you know, Trump's going to change it or current administration's going to change it or something like that. You're kidding yourself. We are on a track to transform payment. And when we transform payment, we're going to get to this in a little bit, it, we're going to fundamentally change the way we deliver uh, sick care and health care resources. So those are the two things I take away from MACRA. And we better get going. We're never going to get through this thing. <laughs> Remember that three hour talk I warned you about? Um, and, and feel free to raise your hand if I've gone over something or I'm using too many acronyms. Sometimes, you know, we just get going and then, so. Uh, the next thing, you know, interesting right here. Um, here you know, here uh, Anthem came out in, in a number of states, came out with a demonstration saying, hey, in hospitals, we are not going to pay for hospital-based MRIs or CTs. Now, now, as a hospital, what, do, what, what does that do to you? How much, you know, that, a lot of the cream in the system was around MRIs and CTs. And all of a sudden, you got a large commercial payer saying, ah, that's not going to work anymore for you. And we're taking that away. So we got all of these things coming. And, 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 and I look at kind of you know, just those things that we just looked at and hold off on the new market entrance for now. We'll, we'll talk to it about them in a minute. But, uh, but I look at it and say, we live in this system right now, fee for service is about price, right? P times V, price times volume equals revenue. Right? How much you get paid times the units of service you can generate generates your revenue. And you think about some of the things that are going on in the market here. I would suggest it's a fundamental attack on the V side of this thing. Right? We saw, you know, I show you, you know, volume. The volume is being attacked, especially the high paying volume. Outpatient services are still going up, but they pay at a fraction of, the, of, of an inpatient unit of stay. And so when price, times, or when price times volume is net revenue, and volume is coming out through, in, through all of these things going on in the industry, what do we got to do to maintain net revenue? Yeah, right. It's increased price. That's easy, right? 
go to Highmark, say, hey guys, some, we, we lost 5% of our volume this year, we need a 10% increase in price. How's that going to work for you? <laughs> Ever work for you, you and Jerry over at Deltana? No. No, that's not happening. So now what do you got to do? If you want to maintain this, what do you got to do? We'll leave that one. The second thing, and this is big, is, is um, the Affordable Care Act. You know, I look at the Affordable Care Act having three major impacts on, on, on rural hospitals. First is, this, more people have insurance. And more people do have insurance. And frankly, everything that's politicized in Washington, D.C. that's coming out is, is mostly an attack on more people having insurance. Right? It's this fundamental, you know, we better not get into this now, but it's a fundamental, you know, kind of one side thinks that there's a right to health care, access to health care, and another side thinks that is not a fundamental right to access to health care. I'm not going to get into that debate right now. Hopefully at the end of this comp presentation, you will not know if I'm a Republican or Democrat. Um, but we, so, so the first piece of the Affordable Care Act is more people have insurance. So, so I look at that and say, you know, release pent up demand for services, and that happened. The second thing, traditionally underserved areas and populations are going to have more competition because